All right, so at Park, we like to say that we're putting the omics in health economics, and today we are going to do just that. This session brings together experts in genomics and economics outcomes research to talk more about the dollars and cents that we can avoid spending and some of the models and examples that we can highlight in showcasing that cost savings. Our first speaker, Richard J. Wilkie, is Chief Science Officer of ISPOR, the leading global professional society for health economics and outcomes research. At ISPOR, Dr. Wilkie is responsible for designing and implementing strategic initiatives related to scientific research and content priorities that will advance the society's mission of promoting health economics and outcomes research excellence to improve decision making for health globally. Previously, Dr. Wilkie was Vice President, Outcomes and Evidence Cluster Lead at Pfizer for its Global Health and Value Division. He has also served in a number of leadership roles with affiliated organizations, including Chair of the ISPOR International Council, ISPOR Board of Directors, and Chair of the Pharma Health Outcomes Committee. Prior to joining industry, Dr. Wilkie served as a Department Director in the Center of Health Policy Research at the American Medical Association and held research and teaching positions at The Ohio State University. Dr. Wilkie earned a PhD and MA in economics from John Hopkins University. He has authored more than 80 scholarly publications that examine the science and methodologies of health economics and outcomes research. Thank you. Um, Alejandro, let's start the slides. Please. So, uh, this is called targeting, targeting value assessment for personalized medicine. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and that's just me. Next slide, please. So, um, we realize that there, while there's a general familiarity with cost effectiveness analysis here, there, there are also a variety of backgrounds of participants here. And it, so it might be useful to step back just to touch and talk about um, cost effectiveness analysis and why we use it. And in particular, with, with some context that while cost effectiveness analysis is the go-to method for health technology assessment for um, some governments, a few, quite a few, it's, it's not so much used in the US, it's getting used more, but there are questions and concerns and from both the patient and the payer side. So it's probably helpful to dig in to it a little bit so we can better understand how it can be best used for personalized medicine and pharmacogenomics. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of background on why we use cost effectiveness analysis, paid price determination and coverage decisions, strengths and weaknesses. ISPOR a few years ago realized that we needed to address some of the concerns in the US in particular around CEA and did a special task force report on this. I'll briefly mention that. And then we'll talk about how standard CEA is used for personalized medicine and, and also how more recent considerations and some of our task force recommendations can perhaps use it to better value personalized medicine. So next slide, please. So I'll start here with some real basics and uh, um, uh, uh, my apologies to the economists in the audience or those who are very familiar with this, but it's, it's still a good starting point. Um, we generally think of markets as having a demand side and a supply side. Uh, the demand side having many potential buyers, a variety of different buyers, some willing to pay a lot, some paying not so much uh, ability or willingness to pay, um, resulting in a demand curve that the lower the price goes, the more people are willing to buy it, a, a given good or service. On the other side, the supply side, those who create the product, um, in a, in a uh, typical market we like to think about as uh, in these cases, there are many potential sellers and there's competition among those sellers for production inputs. Um, all that leads, there are resource costs for producing any. So what this leads to as the price goes up, the more sellers enter the market and supply more. Through all these market interactions, there's back and forth about what the price should be and you know who's going to sell and how much. And in the end, and this is the invisible hand you've all heard about without anybody actually making a determination, the market finds itself at a place where of equilibrium, where the willingness to pay of the last buyer in just matches the marginal cost. And that is the resource cost, the supply cost of the last product produced. And that's 
what we call the equilibrium point. And, and this leads to what we think of as efficient resource allocation. And this is important in our society, in healthcare, using resource, healthcare resource efficiently. That input resources are used just up to, but not past, where the buyers, in this case the patients, value the goods they produce. This maximizes what we call the surplus or the gains from trade, the net value generated by having this market. And the prices are important as signals to the suppliers about what and how much to produce. Next slide, please. So a very simple graph, um, the demand curve going down, sloping down to the right, the supply curve sloping up. Underneath the demand curve, that area up to um, the equilibrium quantity there is, that is the, the beige and purple area, is the total net value to the buyers. Underneath the supply curve, the purple area is that the cost, the resource costs of what's produced. And that middle beige area is those gains from trade that get um, distributed to the buyers and sellers. And, and, and that's an issue in this market that we, we won't get deeply into. Uh, but in the end, we do want to generate healthcare, healthcare goods, just up to the point where the value is just about the same as the cost of producing it. Um, and, and that's where we get the most value from our healthcare services um, sector. Next slide, please. Now, the problem with healthcare markets is we don't really have good. So why don't you build the whole um, slide, please, Alejandro. Thanks. So in healthcare markets, especially drugs, there, there's not a whole bunch of sellers. There's one or just a limited number of, of producers. There are other limitations to entry, geography, economies of scale, that kind of thing. So we, we don't always have the full set of competitive producers. The, the demand side is maybe even more problematic. Um, the willingness to pay a buyer's may not match, that match the value of the product. That is, there's insurance. So customers are demanders, but they're not paying the whole bill. Um, payers are, payers become agents for, and physicians become agents for patients. Um, especially at the patient level, there's limited information and expertise, so they may not understand exactly the value of the product. Part of that is uncertainty at the point in time of care about the long-term costs and benefits. And there's a big one. Our society feels there's a right to health care that, that may transcend the individual's ability to pay for it. So all those things create a problem in price determination, and neither demand or supply really work right to get to an equilibrium price or quantity. So the problem there is surplus may not be maximized. We don't get the full gains from trade from producing health care, and the price signals to the producers might not be right. Next slide, please. So this is where cost effectiveness has been, was introduced probably 40, 50 years ago to try to help get to a price. And the way we do cost effectiveness analysis, we do try to take into account the costs and the benefits relevant to the, the treatment or purchasing decision, which gets you to a kind of a net cost of the product in terms of what it's produced, the cost per life year saved or the cost per quality just of life year saved. Which then on the buyer side lets them think about whether they're willing to pay that much for the healthcare outcomes and, and maybe provides a basis for negotiating price. The other thing, nice thing about CEA is that it provides structure and a transparency to the uncertainties involved in the value calculation. So different payers and consumers can look at how this is done and say, all right, you know, not sure about this part. Maybe this is not as certain as we would like. Let's talk about it. So it also provides this, that information that goes into the decision. Um, next slide, please. So those of you not so familiar, and I'll do this quickly, um, about how cost effectiveness analysis is done. We have quality adjusted life years, which is simply a measure of post-treatment survival, weighted by the quality of life in that survival time. So let's look at a numerical example. Let's say there's a new treatment and the probability it's effective and more effective than the, 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 the comparator, which is always a thing here that we have to take into account is 50%. And if the, if 
the treatment is effective, what quality gain does it produce? And let's say it's 0.6. So it's extends survival, but maybe it's 60% of full health. That's what that means. Then we take those two numbers and create an expected quality gain. So 50% times 0.6 is 0.3 quality. So that's the average benefit from treatment. And then we use that in a cost effectiveness ratio, expected net cost of treatment, which I'll just say is $45,000. Um, divide that by the quality gain and you get the cost for that outcome. In this case, we'd be paying $150,000 per quality gain. So, are we willing to pay that much per quality gain? That's the question of the buyer or the payer. And that I've intentionally put that in kind of a range where maybe it is, maybe it isn't in the US. It's, it's too high for some countries. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the limitations. Because again, in the US, there are some concerns about how it's used. And I think those are echoed in some other countries, but uh, it's helpful to go to. One is, yeah, please do the whole build off, Andre. Thank you. Um, quality is a fairly simple, relatively understandable construct, but in that understandability, we have a few issues about how it's done. Um, one is how you value quality of life. Do you measure quality of life from an experienced patient point of view or from a general public or a priori enrollee? perspective. And we know that once patients experience a health situation, it may not look the same as it did before that. Another real important one is this linear trade-off of quality of life and survival. The whole linearity of it makes it simple, but that's where a lot of issues get introduced. Because risk aversion, we're all risk averse to certain things, and that's not doesn't always come through in a linear way and other behavioral realities that patients think about and truly affect value. So it can be difficult to determine what the right amount to pay for quality would be. And it can vary across individuals and decision makers, and it may need to vary across product situations. So the problem here is if CEA is used for decision making, but does not really represent how patients and society value the products, it may not represent result in the maximum value of might uh, value of treatment to patients, not the right price, not the right quantity, not the right signals to producers about what future products produce. Next slide, please. So, as I said, a few years ago, we pulled together um, a task force, a special task force on US value assessments. We had a stakeholder advisory group, group of patients and payers and clinicians and all the stakeholders that we went through what we plan to do and how we plan to do it. Um, we got together a really good group of health economists to look at CEA very carefully and make some recommendations. And then we, we vetted our results through the same advisory group before it published, so, which is what we usually do with our task force report. So this is a, a summary. There are actually seven papers in here. Uh, next slide, please. One of the papers looked carefully at how we determine value. And, and this is what some of you may have seen started to be called the core value flower. Um, it lays out the, the green um, petals there, qualities and net costs and productivity are pretty standard considerations. They're very qualities and net costs are the standard elements in the cost effectiveness ratio. Productivity is, is the consideration. But there are a bunch of other ones, all these blue ones. Um, and I'll mention some of them, I won't go through all of them, but they are aspects that have been not only have been looked at theoretically, but also empirically that affect how patients look at the value of a product. And I'll go through a few that are relevant here. Um, and the, also there are some broader societal elements. Equity is a big one. How does a given product affect the equity of healthcare provision across different parts of society, and scientific spillovers, how this works across products and what we learn from one product that helps us with future products. Um, so let me, let's go on here. Next slide, please. There were three task force recommendations I'll call out. 
that frameworks that focus on coverage and reimbursement should consider cost per quality as a starting point. Yes, it's really good information to base um, your judgment on, but it's not the whole story. Consider elements not normally included in cost effectiveness analysis, some of the ones I've just mentioned, but we do need more research to fully validate and particularly measure them. And then we do need to assess, once we've done that, we can assess the value of money and compare it to a value threshold, what we're willing to pay for a quality or whatever our value measure is. Considering other factors, and some of this came through in the deliberative processes that Finn spoke about in the last, uh, last session. Next slide, please. So now let's look at personalized medicine and how standard CEA helps, normally helps in doing personalized medicine evaluation. The one we think of as personalized medicine or pharmacogenomics often having a probab higher probability of having effect. Well, that comes in pretty straightforwardly. Um, if you raise the probability of, ex of effectiveness, you will have a higher expected quality. If you have fewer side effects, gee, yeah, the, the harms go into the quality as well. If you lower the probability of AEs, you lower the expected quality of harms. Okay, so that raises the net benefit. So these are standard ways of, uh, you know, how, how we use cost effectiveness here. Um, an important, in, in some cases, diagnostics come in. We can capture the cost of diagnostics in the whole process, so that factors into the net cost. And if there are better outcomes, we can factor those savings from better outcomes or reduce effect into the cost calculation. So all these are done. I think the ones that have been referred to are already, and you'll hear more about in the rest in this session and others, do all this. And that's important to know that we can do this. Next slide, please. Um, the, what's not typically done is we, pharmacogenomics can reduce the uncertainty associated with having, taking a given treatment or using a diagnostic in conjunction with the treatment. It, it, there's a value of knowing here that I'll show you more about. And it's really not linear as, as CEA would assume. And then there's some other things. Things vary a little bit more than you think by severity of disease. Or the value of hope can come into play, the hope of a cure. We, we can pay, we may be willing to pay a lot more, kind of like buying a lottery ticket, if we think this disease actually could cure us, even if the probability is small. There's a value of being insured that lowers the uncertainty of our physical risks and our financial risks. That's a, and that has value in and of itself. And, and real option value may extend your life, even if it doesn't cure you, a treatment may extend your life to a, for long enough that new treatments could come out. So it, it provides that option. So there are some other things here normally not captured in CEA that do have value to patients. Next slide, please. So let's look at the value of no. And, and this comes from some work by uh, Daniel Kahneman, who you've probably heard of. Um, we're looking at the probability of occurrence on the x-axis. How likely is an event, maybe a side effect, maybe, maybe efficacy on, on, on the other end. And the weight we give it in decision, and this is a value weight. Um, CEA would normally say that goes right along this the straight line, that dotted line, that 45 degree line, basically. But they, they kind of did some work, and this has been validated in other settings, but it doesn't quite work that way. But we give a lot of weight on either end. We, we, we unlikely events are overweighted, but we, on the left side, but we really like certainty. Whereas when there's something in the middle there, the difference between 40 and 60% probably doesn't have a full 20% difference in how we weight it because it's kind of, there's a decent chance it's going to happen. Right? But we, we like certainty that there will be no side effect on one end or that it really will be effective on the other. So that, that kind of nonlinearity often usually doesn't get taken into account in how we think about how the patient values. Next slide, please. 
Um, this, here's, here's a, an example. This is work by Peter Newman and, and some colleagues a few years back. Peter was one of the co-chairs co of our task force. Um, if you look at the arrow, what they asked is how patients, how much for respondents in general, potential patients, what you would, how much you would pay for a test, a predictive test, where it doesn't really change your, your treatment options if there's no preventive option. It, it's just, would you like to know, what would you pay? And in each case, and I've just taken a part of this table here, numbers like 400, 500, 300 some dollars were the mean amounts that patients would just pay just to know about whether they have disease or not. So, um, and I think you see that play out um, in some real life and we can maybe talk about that later. Next slide, please. Here is another slide um, that helps illustrate how much more. So when we do an economic calculation, we usually come up with a net, a net monetary benefit. It's so just another way of expressing how much the qualities are worth net of the costs. And, and, and the economist will come out with a number. But if you factor in things like value of insurance and the other uncertainties that come in and our additional willingness to pay to avoid really severe diseases, you get this kind of distribution. And this was published uh, by Darius Slakdwala, another member of our task force, um, that says, the more, the, if you look at the left-hand side of this graph, the more severe the disease, the lower the qualities when you're sick, the bigger the error in the value estimates of our usual economic computations. This is basically saying our usual computations undervalue improvements for severe diseases, treatments for severe diseases. Next slide, please. And the last one, this, I think this is last value of hope. Here's, here's one up for, um, for um, epilimumab, um, uh, one of the newer cancer drugs that uh, is fairly targeted. It, it actually, if you look at the higher line there, that's the survival curve for the drug group and the lower line is the survival curve for the comparison group. We usually, we often look at median survival, which is that first line there, that uh, dotted line, the horizontal line coming out at 50%. And so there is an improvement in median survival for the drug. But a lot of patients focus on long-term survival. Let's look at the vertical dotted line out there 44 months, and there's a really big gap between those two curves. Granted, this gets a little sparse, but th there's a much more significant significant chance of a long-term cure than what you might think of as the value of the improvement in median survival. So there's a willingness to pay for this chance of a cure, and that's been estimated in dollar terms too. I won't show you that, but all of these both have theoretical and some empirical valuation. Next slide, please. So um, I talked a little bit about value insurance and real options value already. So these are all calculable. And, um, and there, there's some work which uh, out there online available um, through the uh, Innovative Innovation Value Initiative and some of their work uh, that, that shows some numbers on this. Next slide, please. Now, there is one budget caveat. If you start adding in additional elements of value, then they uh, may be uh, they may add they may add at a given threshold they may add the number of products that would qualify as being worth it, or they may allow for an increased price that could even if if um, budgets are not strictly fixed. There's an increasing social trade-off because there's always an opportunity cost to providing healthcare. So you kind of have to watch how you use these value elements in decision-making. Um, next slide, please. And I think this is my last one. So why should these considerations of value matter? Why should these considerations matter? As I've said, we really want to capture the patient value um, and supply treatments accordingly. So if we're not capturing some elements of value, we may um, not 
either supply enough of it or supply it at, at all, which means we're missing some of that gains from trade I talked about earlier on. We're not being efficient in our use of medical care resources. So we have to provide better signals to producers about what type of innovation is valued. And that works on both sides, the high value and the low value care. And hopefully that'll net out somewhere that we can afford it. We would hope that insurance plans that cover treatments with these additional aspects of value will be seen as more desirable by patients and their employers or by the government where the region is. Personal, personalized medicines have really good potential to generate value in these newer areas because they do reduce uncertainty, they treat more severe diseases, they may increase the probability of a cure and other areas where we think standard cost effectiveness, while still a really good tool, may not completely capture all the value that personalized medicine generates. So with that, I'm done. I hope I haven't gone too far over time. Thanks a lot, and then I'll be around for questions later. Thank you very much, Richard.